We all know the secret to Starship's awesome power, right? It's the Raptor engines, the most powerful ever built. They are the key to getting this skyscraper-sized rocket off the ground and on its way to the Moon and Mars. We've all seen the incredible test flights, the spectacle of 33 engines firing at once. And it's easy to think that this raw power is the answer to everything. But what if I told you that for a lunar landing, that incredible power is actually Starship's greatest weakness? What if firing those engines near the moon's surface would be a complete disaster, digging a massive crater? and sandblasting the ship with its own hypersonic shrapnel. That raw power, the very thing that lifts it from Earth, would become its own worst enemy in the final moments of descent. The real genius of Starship's lunar design isn't the engines everyone talks about. It's not one shiny piece of hardware. It's a hidden system of design choices a radical approach to controlling fuel and a level of precision that tames the beast. It's the answer to a problem NASA has been worried about for years. And today, we're breaking down the physics of why landing is so dangerous and how SpaceX plans to solve it without needing a whole separate set of landing engines. Okay, before we get to the problem, let's give credit where it's due. The Starship system, the Super Heavy Booster, and the Starship Upper Stage is absolutely defined by its engines. The booster has 33 Raptors. The ship has six. Together, they create a launch system more powerful than anything in history, leaving even the legendary Saturn V in the dust. The Raptor engine itself is an engineering marvel. It's the first full-flow staged combustion engine to ever actually fly. A design that's brutally complex but also stunningly efficient. In a typical rocket, some propellant is used to power the turbo pumps, and its exhaust is just dumped overboard wasted energy. In a full-flow engine like Raptor, everything gets used. Separate, specialized pre-burners run the turbo pumps. And all of that exhaust is directed into the main chamber to generate thrust. Nothing is wasted. It's a closed loop that runs its cryogenic methane and liquid oxygen at insane pressures to get immense power from a surprisingly compact engine. And they keep getting better. Raptor 2 simplified the design, ripping out wiring and plumbing to make it easier to mass produce and more reliable. Now with Starship V3, we're seeing Raptor 3. This next generation is targeting a thrust of around 280 metric tons, a major jump up. More importantly, V3 continues the trend of simplification. A huge change is the integration of cooling channels, which allows them to remove the external heat shields around the engine base. The engines can now handle the heat of re-entry on their own, shedding a ton of weight from the vehicle. This relentless drive for more power and less weight is the obvious genius. It's what gives Starship the mind-boggling ability to lift 150 metric tons to orbit, making missions to the Moon and Mars actually seem possible. The power is undeniable. It solves the first, biggest problem in spaceflight, breaking free from Earth's gravity. But, as Starship gets ready for the Artemis III landing, that very same power creates a brand new, mission-ending crisis. Landing on the moon is nothing like landing on Earth. Here, 
our thick atmosphere gives us drag for parachutes and wings. The moon has almost no atmosphere. It's a vacuum. To land, you have to use pure rocket power to kill your velocity until you're gently on the surface. For the tiny Apollo lunar module, this was tough, but manageable with its single modest engine. Starship, on the other hand, is a behemoth. The human landing system, HLS version, is over 50 meters tall, and even after its long journey, will be incredibly massive. The power needed to slow that mass down is where the physics of plume surface interaction, or PSI, becomes a complete nightmare. When a powerful rocket engine fires into the moon's loose, dusty surface, the regolith, in a vacuum, two terrifying things happen. Ow. First, the exhaust doesn't just push the dust away, it digs a hole. The sheer force from Starship's engines wouldn't just make a small divot, it would excavate a massive crater, destabilizing the ground right as the vehicle needs it to be solid. If one landing leg ends up on firm ground and another in a freshly dug crater, the 50-meter tall ship could easily tip over. Mission over. The second, and maybe even scarier effect, is what happens to all that excavated rock and dust. In a vacuum, the rocket plume isn't contained by air pressure. It spreads out sideways at unbelievable speeds. As this sheet of superfast gas expands across the lunar surface, it picks up debris and accelerates it to hypersonic velocities. The result is a sandblasting storm of epic proportions. And this isn't just a theory. We saw it happen. When the Apollo 12 crew landed their lunar module just 160 meters from the unmanned Surveyor 3 probe, they were shocked. The side of the probe facing their lander was pitted and scoured, blasted by the debris from their own landing. And that was from a relatively tiny lander. Now scale that up to the power of multiple Raptor engines. The biggest threat isn't just to nearby science experiments, it's to Starship itself. As this cloud of high-velocity grit is blasted outwards, some of it will inevitably shoot back up towards the ship. It could damage the very engines causing the problem, shred sensitive equipment, or weaken the landing legs. Firing the main engines all the way to touchdown would be like trying to land in a self-generated meteor shower. NASA and SpaceX know this is a deal-breaker, and it has forced a complete rethink of how a vehicle this huge can ever land safely. For years, the community figured there was an obvious solution. If the main engines are too powerful, just use smaller ones for the final touchdown. Early concepts of the Starship HLS even showed extra thrusters mounted high up on the body. This led everyone to believe that through the final few hundred feet, the mighty Raptors would shut down, and these gentle landing thrusters would take over, their high position preventing the worst of the plume interaction. That seemed to be the plan for a while. In late 2023, updated designs confirmed the HLS would have 18 thrusters grouped in pods below the crew cabin. And it looked like the elegant solution we were all waiting for. But here's where the story gets more interesting and honestly, more impressive. While these high-mounted thrusters are definitely there, their role is a bit different than we first thought. Yes, NASA and SpaceX documents confirm they will fire during the final descent to assist, but they are not the primary landing engines. The heavy lifting, killing the vast majority of the lander's velocity, will still be done by the main Raptor engines, 
The thrusters are more for fine-tuning and attitude control, making sure the ship stays perfectly upright. So, if these aren't a replacement for the Raptors, are we back to the catastrophic crater problem? No, it means the true solution isn't some new set of engines you can point to. It's a suite of advanced capabilities built into the primary systems themselves. The genius isn't a new piece of hardware. It's in the software and the control authority. SpaceX is choosing to tame the beast, not build a smaller cage for it. The first part of the real solution is to stop thinking about the Raptor engines in terms of their maximum power. For landing, the most important number is their minimum power and how precisely they can be controlled. An engine's ability to run at a fraction of its full blast is called deep throttling. While early Raptors could throttle down to around 50%, Newer versions have shown they can go even lower in tests. This is the key to landing. By throttling the Raptors way down, SpaceX can perform a maneuver called a hover slam. Instead of a long, continuous burn that scours the surface for an eternity, a hover slam involves falling toward the ground until the very last second. Then the engines fire at a precisely calculated level to cancel out all the velocity just as the feet touch down. This drastically shortens the time the plumes are hitting the regolith, which means less digging and less debris. It's a high stakes move. Burn too early, you waste precious fuel. Burn too late. Well, you get the idea. SpaceX has already mastered this with its Falcon 9 boosters, which do a hover slam every single time they land. For the lunar landing, they'll use a combination of their three sea-level Raptor engines. By precisely controlling the throttle on each one and even shutting them down in sequence, they can fine-tune the total thrust. This, plus the engine's wide gimbaling range, lets the computers make constant, tiny adjustments to keep the giant vehicle perfectly stable. And the evolution to V3 actually helps. Each version of Starship gets lighter. The Raptor 3 engine is lighter. The V3 architecture gets rid of the heavy steel heat shield at the base of the booster. All these weight savings mean the lander has less inertia. A lighter ship needs less thrust to slow down, making the final landing burn shorter and gentler. The less thrust you need, the less severe the plume interaction becomes. The genius here isn't adding more parts. It's refining the existing ones until they can do two completely opposite jobs perfectly. If you enjoy this kind of deep dive analysis that gets past the headlines, do me a favor and subscribe to the channel. We're all about exploring the real engineering that's making humanity a multi-planetary species. Your support really does help us make more content just like this. Okay, even with perfectly controlled engines, there's another nearly invisible problem that could doom the landing. Fuel slosh. Not the amount of fuel, but what it does inside the tanks in low gravity. As Starship flips to a vertical position for landing, the liquid methane and oxygen in its giant main tanks will slosh around. In one-sixth gravity, that propellant can easily float away from the tank outlets, starving the engines at the worst possible moment. This problem is known as ullage control. And it's a huge challenge. A momentary fuel interruption to a Raptor in the final seconds of landing would be a catastrophe. The engine would cut out, the vehicle would go off balance, and it you'd almost certainly tip over. So how do you guarantee a steady, uninterrupted flow of propellant while the whole ship is pitching and descending onto an unknown surface? 
This brings us to the second and maybe most underappreciated piece of hidden genius. For its Earth landings, Starship uses small header tanks in its nose cone that are kept full just for the landing burn. For a long time, we all assumed the lunar lander would do the same. But the latest HLS designs show a solution that is both different and, frankly, much more elegant. Instead of relying on small, separate tanks, the plan is to manage the fuel in the main tanks. The key is using the vehicle's attitude control thrusters. Right before the main landing burn begins, these thrusters will give the ship a small, calculated push. That tiny bit of acceleration is just enough to settle the propellants, forcing the liquid methane and oxygen down to the bottom of the tanks and ensuring they flow smoothly into the engines. It's a solution rooted in physics, not just plumbing. This system is almost completely invisible from the outside. It doesn't get the headlines the engines do. But without this clever ullage control, the precision of the Raptors would be useless. It's the quiet, brilliant engineering in the background that ensures when the flight computer commands the engines to fire for that critical hover slam, the fuel is right where it needs to be. It's the genius of reliability. When we look at Starship, it's natural to be mesmerized by the spectacle, the incredible scale, the fire from 33 engines, the sheer audacity of it all. The Raptor engines are, without question, the foundation of SpaceX's ambitions. But if we stop there, we miss the real story. The true innovation of Starship's lunar design isn't about raw power. It's about control, stability, and a deep understanding of physics. The genius lies in the synergy between multiple systems. It's in the incredible deep throttling and precision of the Raptor engines, allowing them to be both titans and artists. It's in the sophisticated software that will pull off a high-risk hover-slam maneuver just feet from the moon. It's in the small assist from the descent thrusters for that final stable touchdown. And it's in the elegant, almost invisible solution to propellant management that makes the whole thing possible. SpaceX isn't solving the landing problem by just bolting on more engines. They're pushing the limits of what their core systems can do, orchestrating a complex dance of mass reduction precision throttling, and stabilized fuel flow. The genius isn't the engines themselves, it's the system that tames them. And that is what will allow the next generation of astronauts to safely set foot on the moon.